these days we can all have control over our image, shaping the way how others see us, that powers literally at our fingertips. Wherever we go, people are snap happy, able to erase what they don't like and enhance what they do. But this manipulation of image is nothing new. Artists have always done it, subtly shaping our opinions of their subjects and the times they lived in. Well, the wind certainly rattled our windows last night, especially if you live... I'm Thomas Schaffernacker, best known as a weatherman, low pressure moving just to the... but also a keen amateur artist. I'll be travelling around the south of England to look at some of our finest artistic gems and digging a little deeper to find out how much of what they show us is true and how much is not. Over the next half hour, will reveal how, just like the social media of today, the manipulation of our appearance has been a constant throughout the ages. From the Roman look being all the rage. I guess it's just like today we follow fashions of the rich and famous. And Lord Nelson's many changing faces. These are two different people. Completely different people. To Victorian photographs so ahead of their time they could be from a magazine of today. I've always had a love of art and design, and the meteorology actually came a little bit later, but when it came to choosing my studies, meteorology, at least at the time, sounded like a safer bet, and I was really obsessed about it anyway. But you know, the artist in me never really went away, and it's only recently that I decided to get creative again, and I thought I'd have a go at photorealism. And I think it's the sort of perfectionist in me that tries to capture every detail of a, of a human face. For thousands of years, artists have sculpted, drawn and painted people, and portraits have taken on many guises, drawings, statues, paintings, photographs. But in a time before photoshopping, how did they manipulate their likeness? I'm starting my exploration with the Romans. Known for their forward-thinking attitude, their arrival on our shores around 2,000 years ago heavily influenced the Celtic Britons living in the south of England. They stayed for around four centuries, and although they were invaders, the Roman armies weren't always seen as the enemy. In Hampshire, it's believed the local Belgai tribe welcomed them with open arms and they settled here, building Venta Belgarum, the city we call Winchester, once the ancient capital of England. The city museum houses many treasures from our Romanization. I'm meeting up with collections manager Robin Isles. Hello, Robin, nice to meet you. Hello, Thomas, welcome to the city museum. Thank you. One of the museum's star pieces was found in a sandpit in the Hampshire village of Otterbourne. Believed to be around 1,800 years old, this silkstead head is a portrait in bronze of a young girl. Probably based on a real person, she'd have been a Celtic Briton, but her portrait has a very Roman look. In some ways, it's a very classical Roman face and a recognisable face of a young girl, very natural proportions of a face, a bust yes. and bronze. Yes, like, like, a, like a Roman statue. Very much, you might get that across the whole Roman Empire. And the British people were very keen to take on this Roman influence mm -hmm. and show how Roman they were. But the hairstyle, although it's a Roman hairstyle, so again we're sort of showing how we're wanting to be as Roman as possible, the way it's portrayed is almost in the form of a pattern. It is, it's very symmetrical. Celtic art is more stylized, not necessarily showing the real thing, but showing it in a, in a more stylized fashion. So this is a fusion of two styles. So the hair is both Roman and Celtic. At the same time? At the same time. The eyes are the other thing. They're slightly almond shaped, aren't they? They are. And you can see the two 
black pebbles that have been inserted there. And do they have any significance? Well, one of the obsessions of Kierkegaard is often thinking of the eyes as being a way through to the soul. So to be able to look at a face of someone who potentially was a person in Roman Winchester is quite something. So this is a bit like fashion, really. It was fashionable to look Roman. Certainly you would aspire to be as Roman as possible because by showing that, you're showing your status within the Roman Empire. More evidence that locals were keen to look as Roman as possible can be seen in this mural, found in Hampshire some 1,600 years ago. Painted on the wall of a local villa, it shows what could be the lady of the house in a Roman tunic and sporting a Roman hairdo. So is the short hair, is that fashionable in Rome those days? That sort of It tended work? to vary from time to time. And I guess the way you found out wasn't by looking in a magazine in those days, no. possibly by looking at a coin that's come in of mm. the, the latest empress and how she's wearing her hair. And just like you might follow the fashion of the, your favourite film star or even a minor royal or something, you can copy the hairstyle there. Um, we found a lot of hairpins, and that's showing us that the women are often wearing their hair up, up high. So even though you might say, well, it's not the best executed portrait ever made, oh, that no. probably is less important. <laughs> that's probably less important to the person yeah. than the fact that it's showing them in a Roman style. You could say it's almost like a profile picture if it is yeah. a portrait of a real person. It is, it is indeed. It is very much a profile picture, even with the patterns around her particular colours. I mean, I can see some parallels there. She chose to have it on her wall. Yes. We display it on our social media. So, along with straight roads, agriculture and language, the Roman look became all the rage with Britons happily manipulating their images to look like they belonged in this forward-thinking empire. So where are we off to next? I really could do with a time machine. Our next stop is the Renaissance, the golden age of portrait painting. It was a time of ostentatious displays of wealth, and what better way to show off than with a painting of yourself? The art of the portrait exploded across Europe and set a style that lasted two and a half centuries. Now, if I were to be painted standing here striking a suitably impressive pose, in front of this wonderful stately home, you'd definitely think I'm somebody, a man of means. And given those somebodies held the purse strings, could they also demand artists embellish and enhance their appearance, their wealth and their power? A bit like photoshopping with oils. Petworth House in West Sussex is a late 17th century Grade 1 listed country mansion in 700 acres of beautiful parkland. Ooh, nice big gas. Today, it's home to the National Trust's finest art collection. A radical redesign was started in 1688 by the 6th Duke and Duchess of Somerset, the Carnier and Kim of their day. It's a showcase of bling. From authentic Roman statues to countless portraits, everything here announces the couple's wealth and status. Andrew Lukes is the house and collections manager. And here are the, the Duke and Duchess of Somerset posed by the um, European painter Klosterman in this very grand arrangement. And what a magnificent painting it is. He's standing there, very proud, obviously a rich, powerful man. What he's wearing is obviously incredibly flamboyant. Does that tell us something about what he was like on a daily basis? Is that what he wore? Well, he did, actually, <laughs> yes. I mean, famous, famously, he even wore the full regalia of the Order of the Garter, which is what you see there, when he was dining alone in the house. Right. So this is someone who was breakfast. fiercely... For, for breakfast <laughs> on occasion. So he was, he, he was fiercely proud of his status. Yeah. And the way this portrait is painted is absolutely reflective of that. The portrait clearly uses opulence, but is everything you see real? 
And there's obviously a story in the painting there because we've got the, the dog and that's a servant there, presumably. Yes, there's, interestingly, there's, there's a black servant boy introduced as almost as a sort of picturesque element to this picture, and it would have lent an additional layer of status of the sitter, the Duke of Somerset, because this idea of having young children as servants, particularly mm. black children, was very much part of that. Did they even exist? Well, did was they that even just exist? added there just for the sake of uh, appearing in a certain way? They, they, they could well have just been added to embellish yeah. his overall image, and the fact that they are there at his feet and looking up adoringly at him is all part and parcel of this self-generated uh, image. So would you say that that painting portrays him and more? Well, well, we'll never know what he really looked like. At this date, it was perfectly acceptable and indeed expected that the sitter would dictate to the artist precisely the manner in which they wanted to be represented. So almost certainly he's made to look taller than he would have done in real life. His complexion and so on in this picture is immaculate, whether it was in reality, we, we, we just don't know. But the overall package is, is, a, is a confection. So these days we take thousands of digital pictures of ourselves and that is our legacy. Pre-photos, people like the Duke would have had a portrait painted and that would have been his legacy. This is how he would have liked to have been seen, portrayed, remembered. I think that's right. But in, in those days, there was a whole team of people involved in creating this kind of product. But legacies can come back to haunt you. The Duke was nicknamed the Proud Duke, as he was said to be pompous and arrogant. Almost a century after his death, one of his descendants mischievously switched the position of the Duke and the Duchess so they no longer face each other. Why would it have been reversed? Well, because it really emphasises um, this idea of him being proud and pompous because he's actually turning his back to his wife. Oh, I see. Conventionally, what he should be doing is gesturing towards his wife yeah. and to his heir, but uh, in this arrangement, quite the reverse. So the descendant was basically trying to have a little laugh at him. Very much by, that. By, by swapping the paintings around, I exactly what it. he would have not wanted. Correct. Portraits the Instagram of their day and just as open to misuse. While we only have paintings of the Duke, there's one Briton whose fame was celebrated in many art forms. A massive celebrity in his own lifetime and still a hero to this day, it's Lord Horatio Nelson. This is the National Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth and it's considered Lord Nelson's spiritual home. And even more than 200 years after his death, there's no denying you can still feel his presence here. This is HMS Victory, in which he led the fleet to the battle at Trafalgar. And over there is his nine-foot figurehead. Nelson was just 12 when he signed up to join the Navy as an ordinary seaman. Seven years later, the 19-year-old Nelson gained his first command. So here's the great man himself, not so great in stature, only around five foot six. Seems that all of the good ones were little. Him, Napoleon, me. Having survived many sea battles with the French and the Spanish, Nelson finally lost his life at the age of 47 during his greatest victory, the Battle of Trafalgar. Today, he's as popular as ever. But why was he such a celebrity? Nick Hewitt is the museum's head of collections. Nick, hello. Thomas, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Wow, I mean, Nelson is absolutely everywhere. Why was he so celebrated? He's Britain's greatest admiral, um, but that's not the whole story. There were great admirals before Nelson and there were great admirals after him. Mm. But Nelson was a celebrity. He was the idol of his age, one of the most recognisable faces in the UK during his own lifetime. So everybody knows who he is. Um, and this is in an age when celebrity doesn't really exist. There aren't that many famous people. The King, they would have known. Yeah. Um, perhaps slightly later, the Duke of Wellington and Nelson. And that continues all the way through the 19th century, long after his death. So a lot of this material comes after his death, yeah. when he still remains this icon. 
It's amazing that back in the day, people bought things like that. Just like we go into a souvenir shop these days with a face of a famous person on it. Yeah. They had that in those days as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, it's like touching fame, isn't it? Yeah. If we're really impressed with someone, we, it's almost like we have a little bit of them we can take home. Everyone loves a winner, and Nelson was most certainly a pin-up of his day, with artists cashing in on his popularity. Unlike the Duke and Duchess at Petworth, Nelson had little control over the 40 or so portraits painted in his lifetime. It's hard to say which is the truest likeness of him, since no two are the same. This portrait by Lemuel Abbott is probably the best known. So this is Nelson, as you would expect, isn't it? Is that the man you were looking for in here? Yeah, well, it obviously looks very grand, looking into the distance. Yeah. Noble uh, leader. Noble, handsome man, piercing eyes. Absolutely beautiful human being. He looks actually very calm and almost photoshopped. It's, it's, it's like a selfie, almost. It is. This is the Nelson that the nation loved. This is the icon, and, and that's the Nelson that we expect. And it's very much the, the kind of public face of Nelson. The interesting thing is, um, this is a year after Nelson's lost his arm in battle. Um, his eye's been damaged. He's been absolutely knocked right. about in conflict, and there's no evidence of that in no. this picture. He looks like he's just walked out of a spa to me. He does, he does. <laughs> now, one year later, we get this portrait. Ah. Now, this is by Leonardo Gazzardi. Now, this is a copy. And this picture has only just come to light. It was only unearthed about two years ago. It was hidden behind another painting. So this is just such an important find, and this is the only likeness we have that we think comes closest to what Nelson actually looked like. All his damage and all his wounds are there, his eyebrows missing, there's this horrific scar over his eye, there's bags under his eyes, he's thin and gaunt. This is a man who's lost his arm in battle. This is a man who's been scarred. This is one of Don McCullen's Vietnam veterans staring off on the thousand yard stair, isn't it? So this is what he really looked like this is how he was portrayed. These Absolutely. are two different people. Completely different people. This is the real Nelson. Nelson was a leader. Nelson led from the front, and he paid the price of leaders who lead from the front. He was wounded and damaged in action many times. This is the public image of Nelson. That's manipulated. Absolutely. Did he want to be portrayed like that here? We don't know. It's very easy to draw parallels to kind of modern photoshopping, well, we know that some celebrities today choose to enhance their imagery. We have no evidence that Nelson did that. Um, this could very easily have been a decision by the artist to present his subject as his public would have expected him to look. Why would he allow to portray himself in two different ways, then? What's the point? I think it's very simple, Thomas. I mean, if you were going up against Nelson in battle, who would you be more threatened and intimidated well, obviously by? obviously him, that man yeah. There. Looks so, like he's really been through, exactly. it, through it all, yeah. This is the face of a warrior. My next stop takes me across the Solent, home waters for Nelson, and forwards in time to the 19th century, where moving away from formal portraits, a pioneering woman and her camera captured people in ways that still speak to us today. I'm off to Dimbola Lodge on the Isle of Wight, where in 1864, a Victorian woman set about turning the art world on its head. She was photographer Julia Margaret Cameron. Julia moved to the Isle of Wight to be near the sea. After visiting her friend, the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson in the beautiful Freshwater Bay, she bought neighboring Dimbola Lodge, now a museum dedicated to her work. Julia was a woman way ahead of her time, the invention of photography allowed for real images of real people. But often in quite stiff poses. Julia, however, turned this on its head, manipulating the image to tell a story. Gail. Thomas, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Gail Middleton is a trustee of the museum and an expert on Julia. So tell me about Julia, this incredible person. Who was she? My sort of analogy of her 
is if you put Vivian Westwood in the house here now. Mm. And Jay Z was the poet up the road. Wow. Uh, it, it must have been so out there yeah. for uh, Victorian people to understand. So her photographs were very different to everyone else. Why were these pictures so special? So Julia's approach was more to give a feeling from a photograph, to compose the photograph, to make it more otherworldly, to make it more intimate, rather than just to record what you saw in front of you. She'd make up stories with pictures. She liked to screw the lens right down sharp and then pull it back to make it soft focus. Mm. She liked to experiment with light. So she manipulated the pictures? She manipulated the pictures. She used to, when, when she was developing them, she used to manipulate the um, glass around them as well. It was all to, to do with art, the way she saw it, the way she wanted it. It's a bit like we manipulate photographs these days. You know, like we have mm. uh, filters on Instagram and apps these yeah. days. She was almost like a pioneer yeah, at the time. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's relevant now because we've got selfies, things are taken like that. Yeah. For her, it was seven hours start to finish. Julia's subjects ranged from children she dragged off the streets to her maids, who she photographed many times. But it took lots of experimenting before she was entirely happy. And her first success was a little girl called Annie. And she puts under it my first success. Now, Annie is, like, is, is in three-quarter profile. So I think that the my first success is as a close-up. She went right in and you know, the, the eyes being the window to the soul sort of thing was looking for the character within. So she arguably was the first person to do the close-up. It's almost like taking out of a magazine uh, of, of today. Contemporary, yeah. yeah. So she, she certainly was ahead of her time. Julia's photos broke the rules. As well as being intentionally out of focus, she'd add scratches and smudges. While some criticised her unconventional techniques, others celebrated the beauty of her compositions. But getting these images wasn't easy. I'm off to the darkroom to see how it's done. Hello, Michael. Hi. Hi. Hello, Hello, Thomas. Michael Robinson is the museum's special projects manager, and he's learning the tricky art of the wet collodion process. I just hope it doesn't take the seven hours it took Julia. So. Uh, no, we're not going to spend seven hours. <laughs> um, first of all, we yeah. clean the plate, yeah. take this glass plate, and we then cover it in a stuff called collodion, which is a mixture of ether and gun cotton, and it has potassium nitrate in it. This creates an emulsion on the plate, right. which is then sensitised by soaking in silver nitrate solution. OK. And once we've done that, we have a light-sensitive plate. We're doing this process under the glow of a red light. Julia would have been in the dark handling dangerous chemicals without gloves. In fact, there's a photograph of her out in the hall, which you must see, where she's hiding her right hand under a scarf or something. Yep. And that, I think, because the ends of her fingers were black. Silver nitrate turns your skin black. Uh, that's one of the reasons photography is known as one of the dark arts. I see. The other okay. is because we're in darkness. After three minutes in a bath of silver nitrate, the glass is put into the plate holder ready for use. And off to the camera. So you're going to take a picture then? Oh, yes. <laughs> Our model, the lovely Gail, is ready and waiting. And here we are. Hello, Gail. Hello. <laughs> wow, look at this. So th th this is a, a camera? Indeed it is. <laughs> it's, it's a plate it's huge. camera. Now, first of all, we ask our model, Gail, yeah. <laughs> if she would kneel for us, please. And yes. in order to see this, we've got to cover ourselves with a black cloth. Gosh, well, this is a lot more complicated than <laughs> whipping now, out your phone. We need to take the lens cap off, which is the hat. Ah, yeah. Yeah. We can oh, see okay. uh, the lovely Gail in glorious Technicolor. Come with me under here. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I'd love to. Um, oh, wow. See? Well, she's upside down. And the wrong way around. expected, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Having set the shot up Julia style, the plate holder is put in the back of the camera, ready for the exposure which in our case is going to take a minute, 
In Julia's day, it could take up to 11 minutes, which is why no one ever smiled. So stop watch on. Stop watch on, and, and three, two, two one, one, go. OK. Now, is it very important for the model not to move? Because very. if she will move, then the picture will get blurred. Blurred, indeed. OK, so we're and nearly halfway there. Nearly halfway there, marvellous, wow. And then we've got to stop the exposure with the lens cap, put the dark side in, and beetle down to the dark room. Down in the dark room, the glass is placed in a bath of developer. Thomas, you can see it's... Wow. Um, the picture is emerging. Mm, I yes. can see the eyes, the hair. That is actually amazing, because it just looks like a negative from, from the old-fashioned films yes. that we used to use. That's what we're aiming for. Julia would do this thousands of times to get the image she wanted. And it wasn't just everyday people she snapped. Like a paparazzi, she'd force herself upon celebrities. She especially liked to photograph the great men of her day, including one we're all familiar with, though we may not know it. There's an etching there of Charles Darwin. Oh, my goodness, really? Uh, Back that, of the tailor. That was her. She took that picture. Well, Darwin was staying next door. Julia took his photograph. She went to see him off at the uh, ferry and she gave him the photographs and Darwin gave her some money. And she ran back to her husband saying, look, <laughs> Darwin <laughs> thinks this, this likeness is one of his favourites. Being a friend and neighbour, another of the great men Julia photographed many times was the poet Tennyson. And this was his favourite, known as the Dirty Monk. But the one that's really caught my eye is of the painter George Frederick Watts, the Whisper of the Muse. I particularly like this one here because it almost looks like it's a still taken from a movie or something. It's sort of like frozen in, in time. Yeah, a moment in a story. And again, we've got the sort of effects there. Blurred edges. The, the blurred edges, the, the blobs. And actually looking at these pictures, it's inspiring me uh, uh, how to do my own artwork, I think. I've, I've already got an idea of perhaps, I don't know, painting Einstein or something and maybe blurring out the images and adding splodges there and not making it look like a realistic mm. picture. So, yeah, it's really interesting to see that that was being done 150 years, years ago. ago, yeah. That's uh, lovely that it's inspired you. They say that a picture says a thousand words, but I've learnt that not all of the words may be true. And in the past, it's the artists that were able to manipulate the picture of their subjects and make them appear as perhaps something they're not. Whereas these days, we have the ability to alter our appearance. We've got that ability in our fingertips. So what will the future generations make of who we are and how we live from the images that we leave behind? Will we just be a footnote in future textbooks or will we merit our own chapter when our art becomes part of art history? Bring treasures from museums and galleries into your own home to explore. Try the new Civilizations Augmented Reality app on your mobile phone. Phil makes a shocking discovery about the car lot next tonight. EastEnders is coming up on BBC One. Well, on BBC Two, it's the grand final of Only Connect.